Memphis Church. This is Michael, the Playmaker Irvin, three-time Super Bowl champion with the Dallas Cowboys. And I wanted to come to you from what we would call this hollow ground called the Super Bowl. I am at the Super Bowl right now, Super Bowl 55, standing in the stadium of Tampa Bay. Now listen, I haven't been in a stadium all year because COVID, COVID and COVID has knocked us out of our routine in life. But I'm here to tell you guys, thank you for the support, but most importantly, Compass Church, thank you for the dedication and not allowing COVID or anything else to stop you from what you must do. You know, there was a time that our Cowboys, our Dallas Cowboys, basically lived in this game. We played in this game many times in the 90s. And when we walked on this field, my job was to catch footballs and score touchdowns. And I did that well, I was unstoppable. But the reality is you have been unstoppable. Your job is to contact and save souls. And you, you have to get many people as you can possibly get into the real Super Bowl which is that glorious land that our glorious God has for us in heaven. I didn't stop when it came to doing my job. I was unstoppable. You must never stop when it comes to doing your job. You must remain unstoppable. Your job is more important than all of this because this too, all of this glorious place that we call here on earth should dissipate and leave. But the glorious place that Compass Church is helping guide souls should live forever. Compass Church, keep doing what you're doing and keep saving and keep filling stadiums like this with God's children. That's what he gave us orders to do. I love you. Keep doing what you do. You probably didn't know that when you came to Compass today, Michael Irvin would be joining us, right? So welcome to Compass, man. That dude's fired up. I am fired up as we kick off this new series, Unstoppable. And I'm glad that you're here, whether you're in person, whether you're at home. And if you're a guest, an extra special welcome to you. I would love to meet you after the service is over. If you're in person, stop by the Next Steps area on your way out. If you're online, hey, text the word Connect NFW to 94000 uh, right now. We want to send you a gift. We want to know who's joining us, and we're so glad that you're here. And as Anthony said, we're in this series called Unstoppable, so we want everybody to have one of these guidebooks. If you did not get one, our section host, they'll still come around. They can get you one of these right now. Uh, but you need this resource each and every week of this series. It's, kind of, it's uh, kind of what we're going to be going through as we go through this, and so we want you to be involved. If you're online, all those resources are downloadable at compass.church forward slash unstoppable. So you can download those there or we'll send those to you or you can stop by the office and pick those up. Well, as we get into the message today, there's just a couple of things. Uh, I just want to review where we were last week and just talk about the book again for a minute in case you missed it. Uh, at the beginning of this book is the vision pages. It tells the story and, and there's pictures of, of what we're hoping to do through this unstoppable initiative. I got to tell you, my favorite thing that, that we are going to do through this unstoppable initiative is that we are going to pay off six million dollars in medical debt for people right here in our community. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited thinking about that. And so I, I'm excited about that. You can read more about what's going to happen through the Unstoppable Initiative. Then after that, starting on page 26, uh, are the message note pages. We're going to actually be on page 30 today. So you can put your thumb there and we'll get there in a minute. And after the message note pages, uh, there is the community group discussion questions. And so uh, if you're in a community group, we want you to, to talk about and watch these videos and, and discuss these unstoppable questions that we're talking about. If you're not in a community 
community group. We want you to get involved in a community group. And so you can find out more information about that in person at the Unstoppable Hub out in the lobby. If you're online, all of that is available on the Unstoppable website as well. So we want you to get involved in community during this uh, series. And, and maybe you're like, I'm not sure about the whole community group thing, Pastor Nate. Well, we have something else called the Unstoppable Collective, which is more of an online live stream classroom format with Rob Moppin, who is our executive pastor of, of uh, leadership. And he was a former Bible college professor. He's an incredible uh, teacher. And you can join on that. It's Wednesday nights. You can find out more information about that at the Hub or online as well. But we want you to get connected. We want you to engage during this series. And then the final thing in the back of, of the book is this commitment card. And if you, if this is your first week, go ahead, take that out. Uh, hopefully the rest of you, you have this displayed somewhere prominent where you see it on a regular basis. But what we want you to do during this series is we just simply want you to begin to pray about what it is that God might want you to do. And as you think about what God might want you to do uh, through this series, just ask a simple question. And that question is this. What does unstoppable generosity look like for me? What does it look like for my family? And then we're going to come together on a, a co commitment weekend on uh, March 7th, and we are going to bring these commitment cards. And so we're just praying that God would, would share with us and speak to us what it is that he wants us to do. That, that's what Amanda and I are doing. We're, we're writing down some numbers, some, some numbers we think we can do, some big, bold numbers, and we're just asking God to show us uh, maybe what it is that he wants our family to do because we want to we take this leap of faith. We want to make the most unstoppable and generous commitment that we've ever made because we believe so strongly in this initiative and what it's going to do, not just for us, but for future generations. And then the last thing before we get into the message today uh, that I want to share with you is that the Advanced Commitment Night, man, as Anthony said, we want you to be there. We, we want to invite you to make those early commitments on February 19th, Friday night. It's going to be incredible. And it's in person. It'll also be available online if, you, if you're still kind of taking COVID protocol safety things, and we understand that. But it's going to be a COVID-friendly environment as well. But we want you to be there and listen. As the North Fort Worth campus pastor, like we got to represent, all right? Like we got, we, as Anthony said, we got to be the, the loudest and the orneriest because that's what Pastor Drew calls us anyway. So let's just go ahead and embrace that, all right? And uh, let's be that, that campus that leads out in worship that night. It's going to be incredible. And if you thought it was cool having Michael Irvin here today, I'm telling you, we've got some things planned for the 19th that you are not going to want to miss. So I hope that you'll join us for that. Well, you know, a few weeks ago, I came across a, a story about a, a woman by the name of Sarah Harmeyer, who she quit her job back in 2012. She lives here in the DFW area. She was a, a fundraising and charity events organizer, and she quit her job to pursue something that she felt called by God to do. It's something she had been wrestling with for some time, and she, she, wasn't try, she was trying to figure out what it was, and then she realized what God was calling her to do. It was what she loved most in life, and that was gathering people around a table and celebrating others. And so she came up with this idea that she was going to start inviting her neighbors over to her home for a meal. Now, to make this happen, she, she asked her dad to build a table that she would put in her backyard that would seat 20 people or upwards of 20 people around it. And then she got this creative idea to go to the next door website and she started inviting her neighbors. She thought a few would show up. She invited 300 of them though. And on that first night, 90 people showed up at her house. In an interview that was done a few years ago as she was reflecting back on that night, she said this, I was absolutely blown away. I realized that night as people kept coming down the driveway that people just wanted to be invited. Well, for the past eight years, Sarah has had more than 3,000 people who have eaten a meal around her table. It, it sparked what is now called the neighbor's table. It's this, this initiative that she has. Her, and her goal through this new venture was by the end of 2020 to have one of these tables like the one in her backyard in, in each of the 50 states in the United States of America. And she wanted to do that by the end of 2020. Now, the driving force behind this for her, this goal, is that she had seen the power of community around her own table, and this spurred this idea to launch a mission of love towards others. In this interview that was done a few years back in Real Simple Magazine, uh, she was reflecting on this, and she said something that I thought was so powerful. Listen to these words. She said, 2,000 years ago, we were invited to love our neighbors, and that is for sure what drives me. The world is a little crazy right now. This was two years ago. It's gotten a little crazier since then, right? And she said, we could use more love in our interactions. 
A lot of people need to feel included and seen. And it's hard for my neighbors are not like me. But there are ways we can connect. And the table is a beautiful, natural place to do that. When you're sitting at a big table, you feel like you are part of something. Now, now the reason that I share Sarah's story today is it proves this truth that we want to talk about as we dig into Acts chapter 2, and that is this, is that we were created to live in community. Actually, I love what Sarah says in the statement that she made. She says, a lot of people need to feel included and seen. And that's the truth, right? Like, like everywhere, people, they, they are looking for a place to connect. They are looking for this place to belong. And we here at Compass, we believe that that place is the church. And that's what we're going to see as we dig into Acts chapter 2 today. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, go ahead, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Uh, and we're gonna, as you're turning there, I'll just go back and I'll review where we were last week in case you missed it. But we kicked off this unstoppable initiative last week and we said a few things that I just want to review. The first thing that we said is an unstoppable mission should be for everyone. And then we talked about that an unstoppable mission should extend everywhere. And then we also said this. We said God always uses people who know him to reach others who don't know him. But, but maybe you never thought about this before, but, but we also said this. God always uses people who know him to resource reaching others who don't know him. So, so with that in mind, here's what I want to go today. We want to talk about what happens and what it looks like when, when the church looks like the church that we read about in Acts chapter 2. It looks like the church that Jesus called us to be. Because what we see in Acts chapter 2 is this, this God's plan for unstoppable community and what that's supposed to be like. Now, just a reminder as we get to Acts chapter 2, you, you read Acts chapter 1, what you find is that Jesus was still walking around on this earth. He had resurrected from the dead. He had come back like he promised. And he's walking around, and, and then all of a sudden he's like, it's about time for me to leave, but he commissions them. He, he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where we landed last week, I want you to tell people about me everywhere. It, this message is to extend to everyone. And then he was like, peace out, right? And so he leaves, and when he leaves, th these early followers are like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> they, they weren't sure what to do. Jesus is gone. What is our plan? And what we find in the book of Acts is this is that God's plan is the church, that God's plan is people. And in our context, that means that God's plan is compass. And so when it comes to what God envisioned for the church to be like, it's right here in Acts chapter 2. So listen, if you're, if you're maybe new to compass or, or maybe you're online and you're just checking it out, you're like, I, before I go to the theater, I want to find out what this church is all about. Like what we see in Acts 2, this is what we are striving to be like here at compass. And we are going to do our best to be just like this church. And what happens in Acts 2 when I read it, every time I read it, it's one of those moments you, like, that I wish that I was around when it happened. It's one of those moments where I wish that I could have experienced what happened on this day. But Luke, who's writing this, he says that, that on this particular day that this happens, the Holy Spirit shows up and this is a game changer. Peter, this guy who, who Jesus commissioned, he said, you be the rock on which this, this movement would be built. He, he preaches this first sermon and there are thousands of people there on this day and they are blown away by it. And what Peter says is so powerful. Now, we don't have enough time to, to read all of it today, so I want to encourage you to go back this week and read Acts chapter 2 verses 22 to 37, uh, but I'll give you a basic summary of it, all right? I, I tried to condense it down into two sentences. This is the Gen Z translation, but, but basically, Peter said this, yo, Jesus was God's boy, no cap. Y'all were sussing on him like he was an imposter. Jesus told death, you wildin', now straighten up and fly right. That, that's what my kids say at home. I, I don't know what that actually means, you know? Uh, so if you're like, what in the world did Pastor Nate just say? How about this? I, this is a Texas heritage paraphrase. Jesus was God's boy. Y'all killed him. He told death, come and take it. Now do what I tell y'all to do. All right. Now, for those of you who are from Texas, those of you online who are watching in another state, you're like, I still don't understand. Right. Basically what Peter said is you killed Jesus, but God raised him from the dead. So take that. Right. And so Peter preaches this message. And what happens is after that, it says that they were all cut to the heart. They were like, like, man, Peter, that hurts. Like, we can't believe you just called us out like that. And what suddenly happens is they became aware, they shared a joint problem, that they were all human and that they had all witnessed something brand new, that God had been real among them and they kind of missed it. And their former groups, 
and their former cliques, they, they were not enough to protect them against something this massive. So, so guess what they responded with? They were like, what do we do? Which, if you think about it, that, that's something that we've been asking a lot over the last year, isn't it? What do we do with all this racial and political tension in our world? What do we do in the midst of this pandemic? Like, like people have been asking, what do we do now? And that's what they were asking here in Acts 2 as well. Well, Peter responds by saying this in verse 38 and following. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And then we skip to verse 41. It says this, those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, I want you to imagine this moment for a minute. Uh, Peter's words, they, they mess with the people so much that they were like, what do we do now? And Peter says, listen, if you repent, if you are baptized, then you will be forgiven of your sins. But not only that, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so on this day, 3,000 people accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, and they get baptized. I mean, think about this. What an incredible decision day that might have been, right? I, I, actually, I'm praying that one day at Compass North Fort Worth, there would be a day where we would see 3,000 people on one day. Get, it, get baptized in the baptistry in our new lobby. Wouldn't that be incredible if that happened? And what we see here is it doesn't stop there. This just begins the movement. What, what happens next in verse 42, we're going to look at it here in a minute, is this is where we see this true community begin to be formed. So let's pick back up in verse 42 and notice what it says there. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So in our context, that, that's the, the word of God that we have, the Bible. That, that's what we hold on to. They were studying what the apostles were teaching. They, and then, and I love, like right now, we've been doing this, um, this Acts study and a new version with some of you. You've been a part of that. And listen, I'd love for you to join me in that. And we've been having this incredible conversation on there about what Acts says to us. And I would encourage you to join in on that. Uh, you can find the link to that on my YouTube, uh, Facebook page. And I would love for you to join that conversation. So they, they were studying the apostles' teaching. And then they were devoted to fellowship. So they were in community with one another. And to the breaking of bread. So this is, in our context, this is communion, which is something we do here each and every week at Compass because we, we're following this pattern. And then it says to prayer. And, and this is really cool. Like I'm thinking about this. They, they were praying for one another. They were praying for this new movement. They were praying for more opportunities. And I want to invite you, as we are going through this unstoppable series, would you just pray that, that Compass would be unstoppable? That, that we would just move and work in ways that maybe we don't even expect or anticipate that God would even do more than we could ask or imagine? Would you pray for our leadership? Would you pray for Pastor Drew? Would you pray for me as we lead out in this initiative? But it doesn't even end there. Catch what it says next, verse 33. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common and they sold their property and possessions to give to anyone in need. This is amazing. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily, people were coming into this relationship with Jesus. Daily, people were being saved. Now, how did this happen? It happened because this early movement, the, these early followers, they had this overwhelming understanding of what Jesus had done for them, and they were filled with the Spirit, which caused this radical relational community. And what we see in Acts 2 and what we see in any radical relational community is it always leads to generosity. Now, now here's, here's what I think Acts 2 can also show us, especially living in the midst of this worldwide pandemic. If we aren't careful, I think... What can happen is isolation will always lead to saving for ourselves. And ultimately, it puts us in personal survival mode. And listen, this is not what we want to be as the church. This is not who we are at Compass. Like, like if, you, if you were at a vision night, uh, one of the last couple weekends, Pastor Drew shared uh, kind of his vision. One of the things he said in that message was he said that churches during the pandemic, they've done one of... One of three things, they've either taken a dive, basically they've closed their doors, they're, they're just trying to survive, they're just trying to make it through and hopefully they get through on the other side, or they've thrived. Actually, I was reading an article a, a few months back that said that one in five churches, because of this pandemic, are going to end up closing their doors over the next 18 months. 
And that is, that's not good statistics there. That, that's not something that, that we want to be a part of. And what I love here at Compass is we've said, we are not going we, to just survive and no way are we diving. No, we are going to thrive in the midst of what is going on in our world. Like, like think about this. I mean, during COVID, we've fed 4.5 million people food who have needed food. That's incredible. I mean, as I think about it, we said we weren't going to just survive. No, we said we're going to thrive. Yesterday, we crowned 72 kings and queens at our outdoor. Yeah, man. Like it had to look a little bit different, but we said, you know what? That's not going to stop us from being the hands and feet of Jesus. I mean, think about this. We started construction on a building in the midst of a pandemic, and there were people, like some of my pastor friends were like, are you guys crazy? Why are you doing that in the midst of a pandemic? Here's why we do those things. We do them because there are people all around us who need Jesus. And for those of us who are a part of this community, we've already encountered Jesus, and we want to make sure that others have that same encounter as we do. You see, the opposite of isolation is this. Radical relational community will always lead to giving to others, which is generosity. And ultimately, it puts you in thrive mode. And that's what we want to do. We want to thrive. The early church thrived because they were in such close communion with others. They knew what the needs of others were, and they met them. And look, I know there are some dangers in the midst of what's going on in our world, especially with this pandemic that we're still in. And one of the dangers that I want to address, I know is out there is this, is that there's a temptation out there to, is to just survive. Look, I get, like, like some of you have lost jobs in the midst of this pandemic. So some of you, you're, you're working at home still and you're, you're on, your kids are online virtually at school. So you're, you're not only working, you're the teacher and that's difficult. I, I realize some of you, you own small businesses and you're like hoping that it, that it gets back to pre-COVID times. I, I, I realize some of you have lost someone really close to you in the midst of this COVID season and it's been hard. And I get that. But I know it's also easy to want to stay in, in our own sphere and just do whatever we can to survive. But here's the thing. If Jesus were here today, if he were standing in this spot right now, I think what Jesus would want all of us to hear is this. I have made you for so much more than just surviving. He's saying, don't isolate, don't be afraid, don't just try to survive. No, you need to thrive. People need to see Jesus in, and they need to see him through you. And I have made you for way more than just surviving. Now, there's a second danger I think we've seen in this pandemic, and that's this. For some of us, what has happened is we've accepted isolation as the new norm. Unfortunately, I see this happening all over the place, and, and what happens is that this isolation has led us to like hunger and thrive for entertainment in our lives, and, and that's spilled into creating this unhealthy church perspective. I mean, what, what I've seen during COVID is that like everybody's downloading all these different live streaming apps. We've got Netflix now and Hulu and Disney Plus and ESPN Plus and HBO Max. Like we, we're downloading all these things, and we can flip through them, and we can be entertained. But I think what that's led to is that it's, it's caused... Some of us who call ourselves Christians has caused us to be Netflix Christians as well. Like, like you say this, you, I'm going to church, Pastor Nate. Like I, I listen to you sometimes when I can actually get up on Sunday mornings, right? But, but, but I'm going to church more. Like I'm listening to Stephen Furtick. I'm listening to Michael Todd. I'm listening to Craig Groeschel. I'm listening to, I'm listening to Pastor Drew too. Like I'm, I'm comparing your notes and seeing if you guys are saying the same thing. And I'm listening. I'm going to church more. And listen, I, I know some of you at home right now, you're staying home because that's the right thing to do. You're, you're, you're taking precautions and you're trying to stay healthy. I get that. But listen, and, and, and this might sting a bit, if, if maybe you're just coming back to these gatherings. I think if your excuse for staying home is because it's convenient, th then I want to challenge you with this. Stop allowing convenience to get in the way of community. Listen, if you can go to your kids' sports games, if you can eat out, if you can go to the store and shop, then you need to make this community a priority. And, and I get, like, some of you might be like, I can't believe Pastor Nate is calling me out right now. Like, I can't believe he just said that. Listen, we can say, God, I'm here for you. But if we say, like, but only when it's convenient. Or, or, or you know, I just don't have a lot of time right now. God, I, I'm here for you, but, but just right now is not good for me. 
what we're doing is we're fighting against the mentality of me. And God created us for so much more than that. God created us for community. The Hebrews writer understood this when he said this in Hebrews 10.25. He said, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Listen, I feel like as your pastor, I need to say this. Some of you have been neglecting this meeting together. And you've been missing out on what matters the most. And, and, and I, I know, like, as, as some of you in this room even, or even online, maybe you just couldn't make it today. Some, some of you have said this to me over the last few months, and, and I think it's so true. You've said, like, I didn't realize how much I needed this community. I didn't realize how much I missed this community. You see, we need each other. God created us for community, and we need to be together. And that's what the early church realized is that they understood just how important that community was. And because of that, what happened is that their community was able to take care of one another. Like, like some of you, I don't even know who's tuning in because you never say anything and you're just there. You're kind of, you're online, but we don't know who you are. But we can't help you if we don't know what's going on in your life. And listen, if this is what the church is supposed to be, what we read in Acts 2, i got to ask you this question. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that community? Because just think about the early church. People are turning to God daily. Like people are getting baptized. I don't know about you, but every time I see a baptism, that never gets old for me. The Holy Spirit was working. It was moving. They were listening to the word. They were giving to others. They were filled with joy. I mean, think about this. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a community like that? And that's what I want for Compass. Because think about it. No longer. No longer did they have to fight to protect the in crowd. No, this message was not just for Jews. This was for everyone. They didn't have to exclude others. They, they didn't have to guard or protect their belongings because they knew they were a part of this generous, unstoppable community that had this radical, relational community about it. And here's the thing. Unstoppable community is something that you and I, we, we can achieve together. That we don't have to pick a side or we don't have to be divisive. We, we don't have to exclude people. You know, I say this all the time, and I, I say it because I, I repeat it just so you hear it, because I want maybe somebody who walked in here today to hear this, because you've been burned by the church in your past, but the church should be a place where people find love and acceptance. They never feel outcast or unwanted, that Jesus is for all people, and we want you to know that Jesus can forgive you of whatever you have done. That's what we see in the early church, and I want to be just like that church. Because they led with love, and, and they focused on what Jesus taught, and that's what we are striving to do as well. Like, like we can pray together, we can, we can spend time together, we can give together, because if we do those things, then this community that we call Compass, it will be totally different. It, it will be this unstoppable community with Jesus at the heart. And look, I, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to be the opposite. I, I don't want to be the alternative, because... The alternative is isolation, and we were made for more than that. We were made for community. And relational community will always lead to giving to others, generosity. And it ultimately leads you into Thrive Mode. You know, there's a powerful story of a guy named Josh who started attending one of our other campuses a little over a year and a half ago, and I want you to hear how generosity through Compass impacted him. Watch this. When I came here, I came alone. I left my wife at home with my son. Uh, that was on the 1st of April of 2018. A move from a third world country to a first world country where you know entirely nobody is, is tough. It's hard. It's difficult. So we, we had one friend who, you know, helped us through the process. And this is how God has seemingly been more than amazing. We made a decision that my wife and my son would come here immediately because it was no longer safe. Now, you see, I just moved here two weeks ago. I am unemployed. I have no job. I have no papers. And now I want my wife and my son to come and I'm living with somebody. Look at the dilemma right there. Now. That's a bit hard. So. My friend paid for my wife's ticket. The lady with whom I was living, whom I had just met, paid for my son's ticket. 
that was the first instance of God working and people being generous towards my family. They have no clue how that changed the direction and the life of my family. So one issue remained is I was leaving with somebody. Now this lady wasn't comfortable with me living with my family in her house. She had a big house. But then just a week before my family came, she sat me down and said, Josh, this is a big house. We have five rooms and I barely live here. I'm always at work. You can live here with your family for as long as you want. I told her, thank you, but I have a three-year-old who is going to run around, break your TVs, do this. She's like, it's a TV. We can buy another one. Eventually, we found a place, a place that was willing to take me without um, a social security number, without a government-issued ID, just my passport. That's all they needed. And you know, it was a really nice place. So I said, now we found a place. Now what? And before I know it, my friend paid a deposit and then she paid up the rent for the house and then uh, she got a loan and bought everything in the house the chairs the the beds the cups the plates the comb uh, her husband gave me one of his old tvs he gave me my first extension you know i say this these people are really generous that's how blessed we were look at that no struggle even if we don't have god was gracious enough to make somebody generous towards my family and I, you know. So then P Pastor Brandon and I, you know, we caught up and, you know, we decided to meet up. And then he became my godfather, you know, he was my American dad. So whenever I had something I wasn't sure about, I had a discussion with Brandon so that, you know, he could walk me through the process before I can, you know, accomplish it. So I let him know, I say, hey, we are having a baby. Now we have no clue what's going on. Now we cannot make it to pay for a work permit. So I tell Brandon, I say, hey Brandon, there are two things. Either we can apply for a green card, that's gonna be maybe $6,000. Or we can apply to renew our green card, which is maybe $2,500 or $3,000, depending on some actions that are yet to be decided. Brandon said, well, that's easy. We're gonna have a fundraising for you for 6,000. I said, Brandon, I didn't tell you so we can have a fundraising. The people of this church have been generous enough to me and my family. No need to push them any further. He said, Ugandans, you are so proud. I said, Brandon, I'm not proud. I'm being considerate. When people help you, you don't want to bother them. He said, Josh, you know how much people love you? I said, I do. That's why they've been helping me. He said, well, do you know how much more they want to help you? The generosity that the people at Compass Church have exhibited towards my family is too much to quantify. When my son was born, they did a baby shower for him. He had enough clothes and diapers and wipes for a year. We did not buy clothes, diapers, or wipes for a year. Sometimes I think it's not faith that drives your, your belief in God. It's, it's the need, it's the desperation because at the time I said, God, now would be a very good time for you to show up. And I pray it was from my heart because I had no other option. I didn't know Brandon. I didn't know anybody here. It was just John and my friend. That was it. And sometimes I sit back and I say, God, how do you do it? You know? So the way the people at, at, at campus are generous towards my family is impossible to quantify irrespective of how they give it, whether it's in kind or in cash, it's, it has impacted my family in a way I cannot tell to this moment. The gratitude that my heart has is impossible to express. I only wish I could, but all I can say is thank you. It's been, it's been great. And I don't know about you, but stories like Josh's are just one of the many stories that we could tell here at Compass because of this radical relational community that leads out through generosity. You know, over the past three years at Compass North Fort Worth has, has been a campus, uh, one of the things that 
we've done is we've, we've had these meals together with, with many of you. You've been to our home. We've had these meals, and pre-COVID, we were doing these monthly, and I hope that we can get back to those very soon. But we would gather a group of people around a table, and, and we would share about what brought you to Compass or, or why you love Compass so much. And, and one thing that I heard over and over again, and probably it might be the number one response that we hear is this, is that I felt accepted from day one. It felt like family. And when I think about the Acts Church, the Acts Church, it, it was a family. That's my, that's my prayer, that, that, that for Compass, for all of our campuses, no matter how big we might get, that we would never lose sight of being this family that we see in Acts. You know, probably, probably one of the hardest things about being a pastor has, has been that we've never lived close to our family. Like my, my kids have never grown up with the the ability to just call grandma and grandpa, pop and grandma up and say, hey, can, can we come spend the night? They've never been able to just go to G's house or to Nana's house. They, they, they never lived that close. We've always been several hours away. But, you know, one of the things that I have loved so much about being a pastor is that wherever we've gone, we've always found family. That, that, that people in our community groups, that they started as friends and they became this family to us. That, that people, everywhere we've gone, there have been people who have become like grandparents to our kids. And even though our biological family has not been close, we have always found family. And you see, in healthy, thriving churches, guess what? This is exactly what you will find. You will find family. When people start serving together, when they are in community together, when they are worshiping together, what happens is there are these bonds form and these relationships that, that happen. And, and sometimes those relationships, they become stronger than, than the family that you have. And you realize that you have family that you didn't even know you had. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the last words I want to read to you today, I love what it says there. It says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is what happens when the community is so radically generous that other people take notice. Daily, people were becoming a part of this community. And that's, that, that's what I want for Compass. Because I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be incredible, like if one day when we, we move into our new building right there on 287, if every single day, I mean, seven days a week, there are people getting baptized in that brand new baptistry. Wouldn't that be incredible? I mean, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be incredible, wouldn't it be incredible if people came into our building and they went to grab a cup of coffee at the coffee shop that's going to be open every day, and, and, and they came in for coffee and they, they had no intentions of finding Jesus, but they felt compelled, like why would a church do something like this? And because of that, they come back on a Sunday and they find Jesus in the midst of it. Wouldn't it be incredible if families from our community, they might come to a relationship with Jesus all because we said we were a church that wasn't afraid to have our doors open to our community and show our community what we were for rather than what we were against, and they find Jesus there as well. It, wouldn't it be incredible if people, they drove down 287 and, and one day there's going to be a sign on the outside of that building that says Compass Christian Church, and they're going to be like, I know about that place. I've heard about them. They love people, man. They care about people. They're feeding thousands and thousands of people. Maybe somebody's going to drive past and go, that's the church that paid off my medical debt. Wouldn't it be incredible if people wanted to be a part of this community because we just said we are going to do whatever it takes to be unstoppable? This is why the primary goal of unstoppable is 100% engagement. It's God's invitation to us. He is inviting all of us into this generosity that comes through community this unstoppable type of community that knows no barriers and knows no hesitations. So, so let me just challenge you with this today as we close. I want to encourage you, whether you're in person or you're online, make community a priority. Don't neglect this gathering. We need each other. So find a group, all right? Get connected. Make sure you're going and getting in that community group or, or going to the Unstoppable Collective. Get connected. Serve. Be engaged here. We were wired for community. And then let me say this as well. Let me encourage you with this. Help others get connected to community. This is the mission that we've been called to as the church, to, to tell everyone everywhere about who Jesus is. That's why our, our mission statement is navigating people to God. It's about pointing people to Jesus. You see, Unstoppable is this huge initiative, and it's going to take all of us, but we've been called to make a difference. 
And I believe we can do just that. So so this week, I want to encourage you, continue praying about what your unstoppable commitment can look like so that many others can be a part of this unstoppable community that we call Compass. Would you join me in that? Come back next week as we continue this conversation and we dig more into what it looks like to be the church in Acts. Let's pray. Father, today I'm praying that that in everything that we do, God, that we would would look to you for guidance and direction. God, I'm praying that that Compass would look like the, the church that we see in Acts 2, that we'd be this radical relational community that is focused on generosity to others. And because of that, lives will be changed and impacted, not, not just here locally, but around the, the country and around the world. God, help us to follow your, your leading and where you want us to go. God, you've, you've invited us to this vision. Help us to be unstoppable. Lord, Lord, I thank you for the picture of the church in Acts 2, and I pray that each and every day we would look closer and closer to that, and that each and every day people are coming into this community because we aren't afraid to tell others about who you are. Lord, we love you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.